So today, though, we're talking about uh, the Ethiopic Book of Enoch, um, and this is just sometimes called the Book of Enoch. Uh, it's sometimes called the first Book of Enoch uh, because there's actually bunches of books of Enoch and we have to differentiate. And so essentially this is the oldest and most important of the books of Enoch. It's not that the books of Enoch are all written by Enoch necessarily, and there's well, Enoch, first Enoch, second, third, and fourth Enoch like we have, and they're just all part of a set. They're coming from very different authors, uh, but they're just numbered later. Okay, so we'll talk, just to even talk about this particular book, we wanna have a little bit of background context about the Bible and about uh, the canon. And so uh, here we're gonna be talking about, when we're talking about Enoch, we're talking about Old Testament, or uh, for the, what Christians call the Old Testament, uh, also the Hebrew Bible for uh, Judaism. Um, and so although um, probably most people who are here who know, but not all Christians know, um, although it's published, you know, kind of as a single book. Oops, I shouldn't walk over there, I guess. <laughs> so, anyway, in fact, uh, the Old Testament is made up of multiple books that were not all written at the same time or place or anything like that, and they all kind of came together to be by edited. Uh, anyway, they're all put together and now published together. But, um, you know, in addition to those ones that made it in, there are many, many more texts that are sort of Bible-like or also uh, sound, you know, maybe sound like the Bible and also are quite ancient and are written uh, in many cases in Hebrew or Aramaic or maybe in Greek uh, that are not included in the Bible, that didn't make it in. So why did some make it in and some not make it in? So if we look at um, how the canon emerged in Judaism, in rabbinic Judaism, so after the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, as the rabbis are meeting together and deciding what the canon is going to be, uh, they come up with um, three groupings of writings that get uh, included. And so there's an acronym that's Tanakh here that's being made from Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm pronouncing this very badly. But essentially, law, prophets, and writings uh, is how these go. And that's also how they're organized. So essentially, the Torah, uh, the most important in the, in the Christian, Christian set calls this the Pentateuch or the five books attributed to Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, then the, the prophets, the, essentially the, from Joshua, well in this case they, they're grouped differently than how Christians group them, right? So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 minor prophets that are all grouped together. So everybody like Jonah and everybody all in one book. And then finally, the writings, which are things like Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, etc., down to Chronicles, right? Okay, so that's that. Uh, and it's probably, it's not clear when this canon is done. Um, there may well have been, very early on, um, some uh, Jews who kind of are keeping to this much more constrained canon. Uh, and they are actually even maybe knocking some of these books out, even. So there might have even been more restrictions, so a lot of them might have been, there was arguments, for example, that Song of Solomon, you know, which is, doesn't mention God and is really an erotic love poem, maybe this shouldn't make it in, right? <laughs> you know, and so, and so that's even true among um, the rabbis as they're still arguing that. But it's maybe fixed um, by the early second century um, rabbinic councils. Meanwhile, before that, uh, uh, in the third century BC then, so hundreds of years before that, there had been this very important translation of all of the texts uh, occurring in the Hellenistic kingdom of Egypt in Alexandria, so the site of the, the great library, so this uh, Greek repository of all learning is the goal, and so uh, Tal King Ptolemy, all the kings are called Ptolemy, you know, is, according to the uh, legendary account, um, you know, agrees that the, the, the Bible of the, the law of the, uh, of the Jews is ancient enough and important enough that it also needs to be um, uh, housed in the Library of Alexandria, but of course, it has to be translated into Greek in order to make it be worth anything in there <laughs> as far as, they, and so they get together, together um, you know, 70, actually probably 72, according to the tradition, the magic number is probably 72, but anyway, 70 uh, scholars who um, are able to kind of, according to the tradition anyway, magical, not, um, not magic, but uh, under inspiration, uh, translate the book, you know, kind of perfectly under divine guidance. So the Septuagint, 
uh, according to its own traditions, or it's the traditions that are early or surrounding it, is also then inspired. And so for Greek-speaking Jews and also Greek-speaking Christians, um, the text is itself you know, often ha has the same kind of scriptural weight as the original would have been in Hebrew. It's now become, uh, again, a divine language. And there's, for many English Christians, for example, um, they have decided that the King James Bible has a similar idea because they have made up traditional stories that the King James scholars had a something similar happen. Um, but that it doesn't, those can't be, those may be faith claims, but they don't, they can't be jived with history. The claims about the 70 are also not historical, probably, right? But anyway, so this has a very different, yes? Uh, are there oh. more books in the uh, Septuagint? Yeah, so that's very good. I almost went away from the screen, right? Oh, so right. you can see here that there is way fewer books in the, in the Hebrew Bible than in the Septuagint, right? And they're also grouped differently. So um, you can't read my slide here so is there, because they're too small away, but you far away, but there's more books that are making it in. So the law is the same, so the Torah is the same, the Pentateuch here is the same, the five books of Moses. But then uh, we have a different grouping here. Instead of uh, the prophets, at first here we have history <laughs> grouping. And so it's essentially the readers here of the Septuagint are more or less saying that um, Joshua is not speaking the same way as a prophet Isaiah is speaking. This is too right. echoey. Um, and so anyway, from Joshua down through uh, Kings and Chronicles uh, and the other books that are, that are more sort of historical uh, are all getting loop, uh, locked into, or um, put into this section. And then these include a bunch of books that aren't in the um, Jewish scripture. So that's Tobit, Judith, uh, Maccabees, you know, four books of Maccabees, right? Yes. When was yes. the uh, Hebrew uh, Bible completed? When was the Hebrew Bible completed, you're saying? So I was suggesting that this canon, so a lot of these books, these books were already written long before, they're, where, before the canon is finalized, right? So the last of the books to be written is like the book of Daniel. And so that's going to be, I, if I don't have a date on here, I, I'm not a dates person, so I need to do it. But anyway, it's, it's at the time of the, um, the, the, when the Seleucids, you know, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, when he just, you know, um, uh, during the Maccabee Revolt. So anyway, so in the, in, do you know the date of that? Around 165 BC. Yeah, so this is when the, this is when Daniel's written. So Daniel's the last book of the Hebrew Bible <laughs> to make it in. And it makes it in because um, it's, pretends to be written much earlier than it is, right? And so because it, it's meant to be written at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and it's talking about that, um, and, and the council kind of believed that, uh, it makes it in when much, much earlier books didn't make it in. Uh, but then the canon is maybe formulated in the second century AD. Okay, and so in here we have, like I say, uh, this is happening much earlier, and so we're talking about um, some of these earlier books, uh, and, but when it's first starting, although the translations go over time. So books like Daniel have made it in here, but the book of Daniel, when it makes it in, it also makes it in an expanded version. And so some of these, some of these books uh, that are later, like Daniel and Esther, um, are longer in the Septuagint and include chapters that aren't in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, and so then it also includes things like, like I say, the book of Tobit, these books of the Maccabees, uh, uh, and then in the wisdom section. So the wisdom section here is things like Psalms and Job and Proverbs and Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, but it also includes books like Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, uh, the Psalm of Solomon. Yes? Would the Septuagint be translated into English? Is the Septuagint been translated into English was the question. And so yes, it has been. So you can get a hold of that. It is, it is an important translation. So it's initially a translation into Greek. The Greek has now been translated into English. Question here. This is a book that the Catholic Church is using in the Bible. So we'll get to that. The question is, is this the book that the, um, the Catholics use as their Bible? And um, we'll get to that. The Catholics don't exist at the time yet as the, at when it's being translated, but no is it gonna be the answer. <laughs> so the Catholics have their own Bible and we'll get to how that comes. They have these books, yes, yes. So we'll get, so we'll get to that. Uh, and then finally, then the prophets, people, the prophets like Isaiah are grouped 
here at the end of that, but then there is again additional prophetic works that do not exist. So for example, uh, Baruch, so it's an addition to Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's scribe is Baruch, and then there's a book of Baruch that goes on. Yes. yes. So who were these, who were these 72 scholars? What was their makeup, yeah. composition, et cetera? Right. What qualifications? So the question is, who are the 72 scholars? And the answer is they're traditional. It's a traditional story, so we don't have any, you know, we can't say, it's written after the fact. They're Jewish uh, scholars who are learned in the text. Uh, there's a massive Jewish uh, community in Egypt, uh, and there's been Jews, there were Jews in Egypt very early on. I mean, obviously, in, according to the traditional story, uh, everybody came out of Egypt, right? But they also went back at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, so we, we are very aware of the, there's, there's seats here if you'd like. Um, no, I'm saying for him. Uh, the... At the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, we think of the Babylonian captivity, so when the exiles all go to Babylon, but an equal number of people also flee to Egypt, uh, and they have a community there. And so, for example, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, who is a prophet that is existing before the destruction of Jerusalem, he also then goes into exile in Egypt, where he's among the, the Egyptian community. Uh, they, and even in the Jewish-Egyptian community, even at a certain point, um, builds its own temple there in Egypt, and which is not the understanding later that later Jews have that you can have temples outside of Jerusalem, but it is what the Egyptians are doing. Anyway, and so when uh, Egypt becomes conquered by Alexander the Great, it becomes a Greek center, uh, the capital of this great city of Alexandria named that Alexander founds. Uh, there ends up being a massive Jewish community there, and it may well be more than, there's certainly more than maybe are living in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a smaller city. So anyway, Jewish scholars. And essentially, then, there's more books that they have included in their translation than later, let's say five centuries later, um, are included in the Hebrew canon when it's closed. But there's even more books that don't get, make it into this list, right? So let's go through, you know, let's talk about it. So from that, uh, from that basis, when we're getting to Christianity we were asking about, so when um, Christianity then uh, emerges in the first century AD, or the first century of the Christian era. Um, Christians are writing their own uh, uh, texts, which ultimately become Christian scripture, are ultimately incorporated into the Christian part of the Bible, the New Testament. Uh, when the Christians are writing uh, that text, um, they, you know, that text we should point out is written in Greek. <laughs> So that text, even though uh, the, the first Christians, even though Jesus uh, is Jewish and all of his disciples, immediate disciples are all Jewish, and their na native language would have been Aramaic, uh, which is a, essentially a, um, an ancient Syrian. And so it's related, very closely related to um, Hebrew. Uh, but anyway, Hebrew would have been their liturgical language, so they read scriptures in Hebrew but the language that they would be speaking every day is Arabic. Anyway, so when the, no, we, none of the early Christians though, none of those people, Jesus doesn't leave any writings at all, so Jesus never wrote a book and talked talk about this is my gospel, this is my message, or anything like that. And none of the early disciples wrote um, their message in, in Aramaic. Instead, when Christians got to writing, they were writing in Greek. And when um, they have, for example, there's many places in, let's say, the Gospels, uh, where they have Jesus uh, quoting then from the Hebrew Bible, they aren't having him the way he would have actually talked. He would have spoken in Aramaic, and then he would have said something in Hebrew, and then you would imagine that the translator who is writing uh, the gospel down, who's writing it into Greek, would then both translate, let's say, both the Aramaic and translate the, the, the Hebrew that Jesus is saying. Instead, the, the gospel writers are writing their own Greek story and when they quote out of the Hebrew Bible, they quote from the Septuagint, right? So this is not a, a, a new translation of the text. They are using the Septuagint as the, um, as the version of the Bible. So it's all very important then for the early Christians. Question, yeah. Does it lose its meaning? Does it lose its meaning? Um, <laughs> anytime you translate anything, uh, things change. Uh, and so unless, yeah, unless you are, I mean, this is one of the reasons why uh, in Islam, you are not supposed to translate the Quran, right? So you have to, you're supposed to, you know, read uh, that holy text 
in the original language so you're not losing meaning, you have to study it. Uh, and likewise, um, uh, Judaism, the you know, uh, rabbinical school is you're continuously learning Hebrew and Aramaic so that you are able to get at the actual meaning of the text. Um, the meaning changes when you translate it and, and so the way Christians try to get around that is by um, looking at multiple translations and doing translation study all the time, you know, and so, um, but yeah, if you're, if you're approaching, if you're a Christian and you're approaching the Bible only in English, um, you, have, you are definitely encountering a different text than you would be if you were an ancient Hebrew reading it. Elizabeth. My great aunt wrote a book called The Hidden Books. I never read it. It's about the Old Testament Apocrypha. Yes. And I think what we're talking about is the um, books like Esdras and Tobit yes. and so on that are in the Septuagint but not in the canonical right. Old Testament. Yes. So yeah, we'll get to that. And so that we'll, we'll specifically what the Apocrypha are is that, like you say. So I'm just pointing out here though, for early Christians, the Septuagint is very important because they're using that as scripture. They're not actually going back to the Hebrew, and they probably don't know Hebrew. So um, the Septuagint then is the basis uh, for the Christian Old Testament. So when uh, Christians started, uh, Christianity, um, some Christians, some early Christians, as we'll talk about next, next week, uh, felt that the Old Testament was completely unnecessary. And so, in fact, there's an early uh, attempt, the earliest attempt in Christianity uh, of making a canon was a kind of a radical uh, guy named Marcion, who, uh, in the early second century, who made a list where he absolutely excluded almost all the books of the New Testament that we think of as the Christian Bible. And he also uh, said that the Old Testament is absolutely worthless. <laughs> And so he had a very extreme position that pretty much everybody reacted against, right, in the early Christianity. Question? Yeah. So I'm just trying to get my head around. Um, is the hypothesis that the texts for the New Testament were written by Jews who converted into this new religion, or Gentiles, or Jews and Gentiles? Because why Greek? Why wouldn't it be uh, in, in Hebrew if they were originally Jewish? who then got converted, right. it, it, one would assume if it was written originally in Greek that it would be Greek authors, or am I wrong with that assumption? Yeah, no, it's a good, very, very good question, because it is a little strange, and, I, and I'm pointed out because it's something that I think Christians often don't think about. Um, and so, yeah, so, so ever since the conquest of Alexander the Great, so 300, you know, 50 years or so before uh, uh, Jesus is running around in his ministry, uh, the whole eastern half of the Mediterranean and across Persia even have been conquered uh, by Hellenistic kingdoms, which is to say Greek-speaking kingdoms. And part of the program um, has been to try to Hellenize and for another, try to Greekize all of the people. And so um, all through the zone that, um, for example, of what we call, you know, the, what became the Roman province of Palestine, uh, but Judea, Galilee, all of that, those territories, um, those are interspersed with local people who are speaking Aramaic and then people who have become Hellenized and are speaking Greek. Uh, and so very close, for example, to uh, uh, just a couple of miles from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, uh, there is a, um, a Hellenistic city where they're speaking Greek. And so, uh, and so that's all interspersed. And so some of the people have all switched over and are speaking Greek. Uh, so anyway, to your point about are the early Christian writings of the New Testament, are they primarily written by people who were um, Jewish, uh, who then converted and became Christians? Uh, or are they just people who converted you know, directly from paganism, uh, the, the Greek religion? It's a mixture. And so uh, in some cases, it will be from uh, Jewish people like Paul, but he is a Jewish person who was born in a Greek city. So he's born in a city called Tarsus, which is in what's now Turkey. But it's, Turkey was, there was no Turks there at that time. So Turkey was a Greek-speaking part of the Roman Empire. Uh, and so Paul, uh, you know, is probably primarily spoke Greek, uh, even though he's a very Jewish guy. Uh, and so then a bunch of the other writers, though, like Luke, um, were probably never uh, Jewish. And so they are probably people that have converted to the new religion directly from paganism. And so in some of those cases, uh, so when Luke is writing about stuff in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke doesn't know 
um, Judean geography very well. Uh, Luke also doesn't know very much about how um, first century uh, Jews are actually practicing their religion. Uh, Luke is very, very versed in the Septuagint. And so Luke assumes that uh, Jews are continuing to be like Luke has read about it in the Old Testament. Uh, and so Luke makes a bunch of errors that way. Uh, and so anyway, so that, that kind of thing is happening. Okay. Uh, so, John, from, yes. John, can I remind everyone that uh, because we're live streaming this event, if you have a question for John, uh, and you just raise your hand so that Urgent brings the microphone to you because otherwise people can't hear you. Yeah, thank they, you. When they can't hear you, they get mad at me. Okay. <laughs> I'll be better at that. Yeah, so we will um, yeah, remember to speak into the microphone. We don't need it for hearing here, but they need it for the stream. So um, anyway then, though, this because like I say, this set of books in this order, that is what the Christians then, the Christians who are primarily spread through the Greek-speaking world of the Roman Empire, Greek is spoken as a, as a second language even in the western part of the empire, um, that becomes their scripture. And so uh, even when, um, uh, when it's being translated into Latin in the fourth century, uh, after it's become the state religion of the Roman Empire, and so now they need to have a good, good uh, Latin version uh, from the, for the Westerners who don't speak Greek. Um, uh, the Vulgate uh, of St. Jerome takes, he uses the same books in the same order that the Septuagint has, even though he himself goes back to the Hebrew in order to make some of his translation. Uh, Augustine, this is one of the things where St. Augustine, who's another contemporary leader in the West, uh, doesn't think is necessary because he says, we, the Septuagint is already perfectly translated because that was under inspiration. So you can just take it from the Greek and translate it directly into Latin. Uh, but Jerome went back to the Hebrew to do it. But the organization and the number of books are taken from the Septuagint. So it is only, if you can imagine, in the fifth century then that the Christian canon becomes fixed. And so Augustine has some meetings, uh, local councils in Africa, and the Pope contemporaneously in the West is having those. Uh, and that same kind of fixed list uh, gets kind of adopted by the East as of the fifth century. Uh, meanwhile, that's at the simultaneously, uh, the rabbinic uh, schools have started rejecting the Septuagint. So they don't, um, in part because of the Christians have kind of run away with it <laughs> and have made it their own, uh, and also because uh, uh, the rabbis have maybe decided that Hellenism uh, has all of these bad connotations and leads you bad ways. Uh, there's an emphasis on going back to the Hebrew texts. And so uh, the Septuagint and, it, and its number of books are, are discarded uh, when creating the rabbinic canon. And so when the Reformation occurs 500 years ago in the uh, Christian West, so when the Protestants uh, break away from Rome, um, they also uh, are doing that at a time you know, after the Renaissance of renewed interest in uh, ancient texts, in literary criticism and this sort of a thing. And so they are also then going back to the originals. And so they are also going back and translating, they, and they also, there are Jews around, and so they're able to look at the Jewish texts, and they say, wait, we have all these books in our Bible that you don't have in your Bible, and Judaism is older than Christianity, so maybe these books shouldn't have been added in. And so then the Protestants take them all out, all the ones that are, are in that the Jews don't have, right? And so this is exactly uh, what Elizabeth was talking about, uh, what Protestants call the Apocrypha, what uh, Orthodox Christians and Catholics call the Deuterocanonicals. If they hadn't, didn't have such a long word, it might catch on easier, like Apocrypha. Almost everybody says Apocrypha, because who wants to say Deuterocanonicals? <laughs> kind of fun, maybe we should say it. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, and so these books are <coughs> Tobit, Judith, uh, the Book of Esther that has extra bits on it, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, the Book of Sirach, which is sometimes called Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, uh, the Book of Baruch, which is, is kind of like the add-ons to the Book of Jeremiah, the extra bits of the Book of Daniel, uh, and so this is books like the, um, uh, the Idol Bell and the Dragon, and so if you've ever, if you've ever, know, if you've read this and you've read the book of Daniel and you have a story where uh, the king of Babylon uh, is having this idol and he, um, 
every day they, uh, they bring a feast to it and every night they close it up and, uh, and then, then they wake up in the morning and the whole feast and all the wine and everything's all gone. And that's proving that the idol uh, you know, is uh, you know, consuming this God, is really God because he's consuming all of this feast and, uh, and, and the wine anyway. And so then Daniel is able to show the, the king that all the priests of this particular pagan God are going in there and having a big feast every night and they're getting all this free food and everything. And, that, uh, and so then anyway, once it, once it becomes shown, then, then uh, uh, the king smashes, all, smashes the idol and kills all the priests. And you know, anyway, so that's one of the fun stories that is in the Apocrypha, but not in the regular book of Daniel, right? <laughs> and then the books of Maccabees. So this is the kind of history in the intertestament period, so uh, of when essentially the Jewish revolt against the, uh, the Greek um, Syrian, you know, kings of Syria. Okay, and so then that leaves this kind of weird, peculiar divide in the canons, right? So rabbinic Judaism and Protestant Christianity have share a Bible text list where it doesn't include the Apocrypha, whereas the Orthodox Christians and Catholics uh, share a Bible that does include the deuterocanonical texts, which are both the same texts, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, However, okay, so even though today rabbinic Judaism doesn't use these texts as part of scripture, uh, many in the first century, many first century Jews, Hellenistic Jews especially, so in other words, Greek-speaking Jews who were in the diaspora, so there were Jewish uh, communities all throughout the Roman Empire, especially in the Greek-speaking East, um, many of them didn't know Hebrew, and for them the Septuagint is their um, scripture, and that included then these deuterocanonical books. Um, and however, and I would also point out here that even in the Aramaic speaking parts of, the, of Judea, some of these Jews considered the text to be canon. Obviously early Christians who were Jews thought of these texts as being part of the canon, as did, um, for example, three of these that are, have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so uh, the group of, um, uh, one of the Jewish groups, the Essenes, um, were ascetics who had a kind of a monastic community, an apocalyptic community, a priestly community uh, where they were waiting kind of for the end times and they were, it's on the shores or near the Dead Sea uh, and they had all kinds of texts and at a certain point they buried all of the texts and then their, their sect, fortunately they buried, everybody should be going, in, in, in antiquity if everybody would have just gone and buried all their texts in the desert, <laughs> it would be wonderful, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyway, fortunately they did, and, and so as a result of that, um, we've recovered um, very, very ancient manuscripts indeed uh, of the Bible, but also extra biblical material, including in this case bits of the books of Tobit, Sirach, and the Epistle of Jeremiah, which is to say portions of then the Apocrypha that are not uh, in Hebrew scripture today. So, if we take these books then of the Septuagint, and there's a bunch more of those obviously than what there were, uh, that made it into the Protestant and Jewish canons. Um, there are still plenty more books <laughs> that didn't make it into, um, uh, you know, anyway, the Catholic canon, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> even though some of them were, most all of them were scripture for somebody at some point. Uh, whether or not it was ever very many people, some people, somebody thought it was scripture, uh, at least the original author and the immediate uh, community that would have been around that author, and then whoever wanted, whoever bothered to copy it. So that if you can imagine the ones that we actually have that survive, it's because it was important enough that somebody actually bothered to do something very expensive of hand copying a thing by hand, and it actually has uh, been copied enough times that it's come down to us. Uh, there's plenty more of these that are lost than what, that what we have that are, that are written and saved. So um, anyway, so these are found in a bunch of different collections. <laughs> Uh, for example, these two volumes of Old Testament pseudepigrapha, of which I have one of these here. <laughs> and when I was a teenager, I would go to my library and uh, my suburb, and I would, this is like two, I don't have the other one here with me, it looks like that. <laughs> anyway, it's two of my absolute favorite books. And at a certain time, point when I was an adult, I realized, and I was looking back and thinking about that, I was realizing, as an adult, I can go buy things myself. <laughs> and, so, and so I went and bought myself these. And so anyway, I was very happy to end up having these. Um, so they're called, uh, they're generally grouped by scholars, or it's been called for a whole long time anyway, these are called pseudepigrapha. So uh, there's the canon, then there's the deuterocanon or apocrypha, and finally pseudepigrapha. Uh, the word pseudepigrapha means falsely attributed, so you know, it's like a, 
if you ever think of a, like writers when there's a ancient text that's not written by it, so they might call it um, uh, Pseudo Dionysius. So Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite is pretty much my favorite writer, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so the guy, the guy who actually you know bothered to pretend to be Dionysius the Areopagite. But anyway, so Pseudo Dionysius, yes, we need to get the mic. Like, <laughs> Is it Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, or is it Dionysius the Pseudo-Areopagite? <laughs> the one who well, yeah, so the, the question would be is if there was, if were there was a person who, who was, whose name actually was Dionysius, but I think that he's specifically pretending to be Dionysius the Areopagite. <laughs> so Pseudo-Dionysius is what he's usually called. <laughs> and Pseudo-Dionysius then ends up having a, an amazing career. He not only is very influential as a um, uh, as a uh, Neoplatonist uh, philosopher who really influences Christian theology, uh, but also um, gets confused uh, gets confused in the Middle Ages, uh, and so he becomes understood to have like ended his life in France, where he was the apostle that converted the French as far as tradition ha has it. And so, if you've ever heard of, if you've ever been to the monastery of Saint Denis, which is Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, <laughs> and then and then and Saint Denis is very much a pseudo pseudo Dionysius because it's a completely different Denis, different completely different Dionysius, but it got confused because with the pseudo Dionysius, and so it's a pseudo pseudo Dionysius <laughs> is where and that's where all the kings of France are buried in the in the important uh, monastery of pseudo pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, yeah Saint Denis. <laughs> so okay. Falsely attributed, um, because in, in general, the books are written by people who clearly didn't write them, or they're attributed to people who, was not, who were not the authors, right? Uh, uh, that, the problem with that is, is that actually that same term, though, then, pseudepigraphic, um, actually applies to lots and lots of books that actually made it in the canon, much less the Apocrypha as well, right? So, for example, the book of Daniel, Daniel which we mentioned is the last of the um, books in the Hebrew Bible to have been written, and it's even written partially in Aramaic. Uh, made it into the canon, uh, even though it's technically pseudepigraphical. So in other words, it's not written by Daniel, right? Um, like, uh, and also apocrypha is also kind of a crazy word because it means hidden books, right? But they're not hidden. We know where they are. <laughs> We've never lost them, so we know where, they, anyway. So those are quite, anyway, it's a, it's a nicer, that's a fun term. Uh, okay, so among the pseudepigrapha, <laughs> pseudepigrapha, um, there's a whole bunch of them. These are ones that are just in my, my couple volumes here, right? But there's a bunch more even in the volumes. So there are things like the Apocalypse of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Adam, the Testament of Adam, the Life of Adam and Eve, the Book of Jubilees, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Testament of the Three Patriarchs, Joseph and Asana, out the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, the Fourth Book of Ezra, the Apocalypse of Ezra, the Vision of Ezra, the Apocryphon of Ezekiel, the Second through Fourth Books of Baruch, the Testament of Moses, the Martyrdom of Isaiah, the Treatise of Shem, the Testament of Solomon, uh, lots of books of more Psalms, <laughs> the Testament of Job, the book of Enoch, which we're gonna be talking about, and then the second, third, and fourth books of Enoch. <laughs> so additional books of Enoch that people have written. So you can kind of see here a trend. There's a lot of uh, apocalypse, right? <laughs> and so one of the things, that's one of the things that's gonna come through. So all of these books um, are coming from that later time period when Daniel you know, is, is being, ooh, that's really loud are coming from that later time period when Daniel is composed, the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel is one of the few apocalyptic books uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And so this is a period um, when, uh, second, of Second Temple Judaism when apocalyptic thinking has really come to the front and there are lots and lots of these books that have been made. And so the fact that, um, that these, let's say, have been in the Christian canon has met and have been rejected then late from the later rabbinic canon um, has kept meant that apocalypticism has stayed more with Christianity than with Judaism, which largely moved on, right? Okay, so this is also at the Dead Sea Scroll location. So at Qumran, this place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the Essene um, complex, uh, among those were also fragments of the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Enoch. So even though, again, this isn't, making, this isn't part of the Septuagint and it's not part of the canons of uh, the Catholics or the Orthodox, they were part of 
uh, the scripture used by the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scroll community. Uh, also, very widely, the Book of Enoch was very widely used by early Christians. Um, so, for example, the New Testament author of the Book of Jude, the Epistle of Jude, quotes from the Book of Enoch, even though it's not in the Old Testament as far as the Christians are concerned. So the Epistle of Jude is one of the shortest books in the Bible, the Christian Bible. It's ascribed to um, anyway, Jude, which is the same name in Greek as Judas, which is Judah, right? So that same name, the brother of James or Jacob, which is to say the brother of Jesus. Uh, and so this is also, even though it's canonical, probably pseudepigraphal, because it's probably not written by Jesus' brother's brother, right? This particular book is also interesting in that it's also uh, reworked and re-edited and made into a much longer book that is pseudepigraphically ascribed to the Apostle Peter, uh, but was again not written by Peter, and that also is in the canon. But in any event, uh, I'm just citing this to one to show the complexity of the canonical text history even, but also to show that early Christians just quoted from the uh, Book of Enoch uh, as if it were part of the canon. So here's the quote in Jude. Uh, now I desire to remind you, though you are fully informed, that the Lord who once uh, for all saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their own position but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in the eternal chains in the deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. It was about, uh, it was also about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, quote, see the Lord is coming with 10,000s of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict everyone of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so that quotation then uh, is the letter, Epistle of Jude uh, chapter, you know, it's only one chapter long anyway, verses 14 and 15, uh, quoting First Enoch, or the book of Enoch here, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And you can kind of see, again, apocalypticism, right? <laughs> as a theme. So end times. Okay, so uh, it was considered by the earliest Christian writers, the writers of the New Testament to have consider it scripture. It's also um, uh, by the next uh, generation of Christian writers who are called the early church fathers. They also frequently quote um, this. So the Epistle of Barnabas is one of the early Christian books that didn't make it into the New Testament. Uh, and also early fathers like Clement of Alexandria, and Athenagoras, or Uranius, Tertullian, and others also all quote from the Book of Enoch. Some of, it, some of them really, really like, like Tertullian, really like it. Um, however, uh, by the time we get to the fourth century, by the time uh, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire, when uh, they're getting down to business and formulating everything, making creeds, and also deciding on the canon. Uh, that's the time period when it started to be fall out of favor. And so specifically, um, uh, both Augustine and Jerome, who tended to not agree on many, many things at all, both agreed that Enoch didn't, uh, didn't make the grade. <laughs> and, so they, and so anyway, so since they both didn't um, think that Enoch should be considered part of the canon, and Jerome was the person that was preparing the great Latin translation uh, of the text. Uh, it ultimately did not, and Augustine was preparing the canon list. Uh, it ultimately didn't make it into the canon. So the question here. So the question is, why did uh, Augustine and Jerome not consider uh, the book of Enoch worthy of the, the canon? Oh, that's a question also, yeah. Um, so they, 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 ar they argue that they don't believe that Enoch is the writer. So uh, the part of the problem here is, is that the book contain, can, contains stuff that uh, mark it out to be written you know, much, much later uh, than, the, than when Enoch would have been alive. So Enoch, uh, as a um, person who is living the seventh generation from, from Adam, uh, this would essentially be the oldest, by far and away, the oldest book in the Bible, if it did make it into the Bible, uh, because uh, the rest of the, the Bible, as it's now understood, 
Um, as far as Augustine and Jerome were concerned, Moses was the author of the, of the Pentateuch. That's, that also proves not to be the case now. In other words, so there was a, those texts actually are written many, many you know, generations after when Moses would have lived. But Enoch is so much further back that this book would have been you know, incredibly ancient. And so they don't find that credible. So now they're, now that they're a little bit more sophisticated readers than some of the earlier Christian writers, like um, Irenaeus, for example, and the less sophisticated guy. Yes, there's a follow-up. So they don't mind Enoch's apocalypticism. Apocalypticism they just don't wasn't find the problem. Him a legitimate personage at all. So they just don't think it was written by Enoch. So they don't. They question it as being authoritative. It's not as much. I don't think it's as much the content that they're wor that they're as worried about. Um, uh, the content is, in fact. Um, one of the things that the early Christians really liked about it. <laughs> so, so there's a bunch of content there, and actually, as a result of that, and we'll, we'll kind of see it when we look at some of the themes, uh, there's a bunch of the content that has stayed with us, <laughs> even though the text is gone. Uh, and so, because the content was exciting enough and it, it made its way into Christianity, um, it became a traditional stuff. In the same exact way, um, I'll mention, for example, there. Uh, Another, so there's so many of these books. Not a lot of them don't make it in. The majority of these books are not making it in, right? Uh, and so it's, it's almost a question of why does anyone get in, right? As opposed to why do you get left out? Uh, but one of the other incredibly um, popular books is the uh, Proto-Evangelion um, uh, of, is it James? Anyway, it's, of, it's the one with Mar that tells all of the stories about Mary as a child. <laughs> So the, there's a all story after story about um, uh, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, in this particular uh, Christian kind of proto, it's called a proto-evangelion, so proto-gospel, which is to say it's, it's a gospel story before the gospel happens because it's actually happening in Mary's lifetime. And so this is really where almost all of the um, ideas and stories about where Mary, you know, what Mary was even doing, because Mary doesn't have a whole bunch of stuff in the actual canonical gospels. Uh, but almost all of the stories about Mary, including even the idea of the Immaculate Conception and everything like that, are coming out of uh, this book that didn't make it in. And so there's lots of, let's say there's even cathedrals I've seen in southern France where they have pictures that illustrate this book that didn't make it in. There's a question over here. Just as an aside, I see that uh, Jerome is writing on paper in a book, and I was wondering when, when do they actually start using paper in, instead of scrolls? Right. <laughs> He's not writing, pro well, he's probably not writing on paper. He, he's probably either writing on, par he's writing on either parchment or papyrus. Um, so Jerome still would have had access to papyrus. So the coat, so what you're seeing here, and I've actually been drawing that I, when I've been doing that, that the originals are all written on scrolls, right? And, and, and then in, in the Jewish tradition, scrolls continue to be used for the Holy Scripture, right? Uh, but Christians are very early adopters of this new technology with books uh, that is called, you know, in Latin anyway, it's called the Codex. And so a Codex is a book like this, right? And so the difference between this and a scroll, uh, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of efficiencies that happen with this thing that you don't have with the scroll. So a scroll, the way it works is you have like a page, and, there are, and the, each one of these pages is essentially end to end to end to end. And you, and you have to turn the two different halves of the scroll or the one, you know, in order to kind of get to the page you want. If you're trying to do any kind of quick referencing, forget it. <laughs> you know, a scroll, you know, you really almost have to just read it. and like an e-book. Yeah, you really, it it's really can't be doing that. So this, and so anyway, it, this, this technology is something that is happening in the... Um, uh, Roman Empire of the, in the early first Christian centuries, and the Christians kind of adopt it really fast. And so uh, it's one of the things that happened. And so most of the scrolls, so scrolls or, um, scrolls or codices, both could have been written on either parchment, which is to say animal skin, or on papyrus, which is, um, we call, you know, we, our word paper derives from this name papyrus, which is a leafy plant, uh, you know, that, that in Egypt that grows in the Nile that they pound together and they produce a paper-like thing. One of the things that Egypt did was uh, export paper, papyrus, uh, throughout the whole empire. And so in Rome, they're still writing on papyrus until they lose Egypt as a province, 
and then they don't have it anymore, they can't use it, and so they switch entirely over to animal skin. Uh, and so all of the codices of the Middle Ages then are gonna be written on parchment. And it's only then in the um, 12th or 13th century that they invent paper making, modern paper making. Back here, there's, oh wait, no, there's one right here first, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering, was it the Greeks that, um, you know, when you're talking about the Mary thing, was it written by the Greeks because Isis and all that? Oh, uh, because of the goddess Isis? No, the goddess Isis and Mary were <coughs> kind of, you know, we sometimes think that the idea of uh, Mary and Isis as being the mother. Yeah. So um, there were a bunch of, uh, so the question is, I guess, if in this, um, additional extra canonical books, a book of Christian scripture that didn't make it into the New Testament, um, where there, there's a much more elaborated um, tales about essentially the mother of God, right? Um, we would have to, we, we'll have to have a lecture, I think, on this Proto-Evangelion, <laughs> uh, and also maybe on the Marian traditions. Um, there are a whole bunch of different, um, like long-standing traditions of, of mother goddesses and the birth of renewal gods, so gods that um, defeat death. Uh, and so, uh, and Jesus is one of those gods, right? And so some of these things that get, uh, some of these things, you know, are tropes that, are, that people are already aware of, so the pagans are already very aware of, and some of the imagery, and so it's hard to say. So it, it did the image that they already had a picture of, a, for example, a statue of a mother goddess that's holding you know, a baby and things like that, that may well have artistically influenced Christians who were trying to tell the same story. And there was one back here. That kind of ties into what I was gonna say. So what were all these translators going back to when you first started? What's their vested interest? Like the first guys, if I really believe on on Christ Jesus and I want to spread the good news. Yes. I'm going to go into my basement and do it in secret so that it's the most exact telling of what I believe, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But these guys of like St. Jerome, who who commissioned him to do this? Like what would be the vested interest for him to leave out Book of Enoch? Like it says don't cut roots and don't, you know, you know, fashioning metal and stuff. The people of that time it's going to be hard to convince them to follow something that's not. You get what I'm saying? Sure. So what, like, what was so the best, in, like, when did the, the interest start getting kind of power hungry, like, you know? Uh, I, I, I would, I don't think that Jerome, for example, is about being power hungry. So he himself is an ascetic. He, um, uh, he has, he is able to get finances from, um, let's say, I think it's, I think he's financed by um, Christian women who are interested in, um, having this in their own language so that they can uh, so that they can actually have the scripture in Latin and because they don't know the Greek uh, and he I think is very earnest in his devotion to this so I think again it's mm -hmm. like um, you know these earliest uh, people like Paul who they're you know ultimately they're not making a lot of money off of this uh, they have a very strong convictions about it and they're probably doing it for that that reason um, uh, you can say later, you know, when it, this is also what's happening though at this time period, um, it is becoming a state religion. And so now the religion does get intermixed up with the government, right? So it's in this time frame that the canon is being fixed, that uh, Christianity is becoming a state religion, and therefore the bishops, uh, who are the different leaders of the Christian communities in the different cities, are functionally great um, officials of the Roman state. And so as a result of that, then there does start to be a vested interest in that because you want to uh, maybe be the bishop because that's an important civic position where you, know, you have a nice salary and you live in a nice palace and that kind of thing. Okay. Okay, so meanwhile, <laughs> so we have all that happening in the Roman Empire. Meanwhile, um, what ends up happening is there's places outside of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, uh, this is, in the African part of the Roman Empire, so there's Egypt, right? And Jerusalem, the Arabian Peninsula, the Red Sea. Uh, the, the Romans um, have trade with India, and that trade is coming down from, through Egypt, and uh, also through Petra, which is what wonderful place in Jordan with all the rock palaces and everything. So the, um, 
uh, on the trade routes, there is this kingdom called Aksum. Uh, and so that's along the route, right? And so uh, in the Ethiopian kingdom of Aksum, so this is where Ethiopia is now, and it's also a precursor of Ethiopia, um, it grew kind of from in this first 10 centuries of the Christian era. Uh, originally, the people there are, like everybody else, they're pagans, polytheists. Uh, but the kingdom apparently, uh, there's indications, was heavily influenced by Judaism. So there has been Jewish spread ever since um, the at first exile in Egypt. And so that has come down to that. And at some point, I mean, anyway, then anyway, one of the kings in the fourth century, at the same time as Constantine, the emperor Constantine, converted and became and started the process of Christianizing the Roman Empire. Uh, king Azana the second converted to Christianity in Aksum. It made the state religion. So here. What about Queen Saba? The Queen of Sheba. Yeah. So yeah, we'll talk about it. So this is so part of the traditional understanding. We'll we'll get to by the time, beginning in the Central Middle Ages, um, uh, the I actually have a slide about it. <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get to there. Okay. So this is the this is earlier. So this is a historic order. Later we have traditional understandings that emerge. So King Azana here, um, his he has a tutor named Frumentius, that guy is from Syria, he's a Phoenician or a Syrio-Phoenician, um, and he uh, later then becomes, when he converts the king, he becomes the first bishop of Aksum. So they start setting up a Christian church there centered around a bishop. Uh, the kingdom adopts Christianity as its state religion in 328. Aksum then is the very first state to use the symbol of the cross on its coinage. So already in the fourth century, there's a coin with the cross. Um, and so, if we kind of have this early, this is an early, this is kind of a early but accelerating to the modern divisions of Christianity. <coughs> can I come over here without feedback? Maybe I can. <laughs> so anyway, this is kind of Europe, Africa, Asia. And so we have the, the split that we're pretty aware of between the Latin West, so the Catholic West, and the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox East that extends up into Russia. So Russia is part of the Greek Orthodox tradition. And then north-south division here between the Protestants and Catholics, but are all part of kind of the Latin West. Then further east, so beyond what's now Turkey, uh, in Syria, in Iraq, and then beyond in the Persian Empire and into India, and then down here in Egypt and down into Ethiopia, there's the churches of the, um, the Oriental Orthodox churches and the churches of the East which even though it sounds a lot like Eastern Orthodox, is not Eastern Orthodox, it's more Eastern. <laughs> so ultra Eastern Orthodox is what we might say. So beyond the Eastern Orthodox, you know, when you start saying that the West is here, then there's actually a lot of East. You know, the Orient is very, there's more and more Orient, right? You just have to keep saying East, East, East. Okay, so of these divisions then, Protestant, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, we're talking about then or Oriental Orthodoxy and the churches of the East, um, they're already divided uh, from the churches of the West, including the Eastern Orthodox, so the Greek Orthodox churches, over Christology. So Christology <laughs> is this incredibly complicated thing, and we'll talk about it next week, because in the first couple centuries of these lost Christianities, people have very different answers to the question, um, we're monotheists, but we kind of think Jesus is God. <laughs> How are we working that out, <laughs> you know, and this kind of thing? So we think Jesus is God, but we're only, well, there's only one God, and Jesus is praying to God, so how does this kind of, how does this all work, right? And so the ultimate formula that comes in the Council of Nicaea that Constantine calls in the Roman Empire is, you know, that the Father or Creator is God, that Christ is God, that this Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not Christ, Christ is not the Father, right? So essentially the idea is one God, but three persons. And it's very, very complicated and pretty much very few Christians get it, I think, even now, you know, it's still complicated. Okay, but let's say, so, but for the philosophy, ph philosophically minded, which uh, ancient Greeks were, <laughs> if anybody was, um, then there's a next question. Okay, yeah, now we have this idea that Jesus is God, but he was also a human. So how, what does that mean then? Does he have a nature where uh, his, his real nature is that he's divine, and that was always his nature, even though he's in human uh, form during his earthly ministry. 
And that's what the churches of the East, so the Nestorians, say. His nature is that he's God, but he looked like a human uh, and acted like a human when he's in. When he's in uh, or does he have two equally balanced natures? So is he both have a divine nature, a fully divine nature, and a fully human nature? So that's diothesitism. Or does he have one nature only, this Christ nature, which is both human and divine? And so what's the answer for all Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox? The last one. Which one? The last one? The third one? The third one. Everyone okay with the third one? No. <laughs> You're all heretics, I told you. <laughs> it's the Christians, one. it's the middle one. <laughs> so, I, did, I told you no one gets, no Christians don't even get it. <laughs> okay, so, but essentially, especially nobody in the West ever got it. So this is why actually in the Romans, in the Latin West, um, they didn't realize they had any heretics until they created the Inquisition in the Middle Ages and asked people what they actually thought, and then they realized that everybody's a heretic. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> Valerie has a question. Yeah, I've sometimes wondered, um, you know, like of course, there, you know, there are these tremendous debates over um, the nature of, of both God and Jesus and, and all of that, but did they ever have any debates about how can one be both a son and a father at the same time? Like, well, Jesus so is the son of God, but did they, was that just like a loose metaphor, or did they take that seriously? So, or? so, so Jesus is the son, Yeah. <laughs> but he's not um, both the son and the father, so the father... Is a, so this is a not equal sign. So Jesus isn't the father. Right. Well, lots of people are Protestants. <laughs> no, anyway, so, they, but no, so the way it works is, is that by saying that Jesus is not um, both the son and the father, Jesus is only the son. Right. But they're both God. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, one God, two, three persons. So the special quality of the of Jesus is that he's begotten, the special quality of the Spirit is that he proceeds, and the special quality of the Father is that he's creator, right? So, anyway, it's complicated and it's hard to get, right? So the idea of it here then is that Protestants, Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox agree in uh, that the way where this thing works is diophysitism, which is to say Jesus is fully human, fully divine, possessing divine nature and human nature in harmony. So that's how they work it out. Not so, according to the Oriental Orthodox and the churches of the East. So the Oriental Orthodox are Jesus has one nature that is human and divine. It's not seem like that's too much different, but it, <laughs> it's enough for them to split apart. And same thing, the divine nature overwhelms the human nature, so that's Nestorianism. So that's this kind of Syrian and uh, Chaldean churches, the churches that go off into India and, and the Mongol Empire. And this is the churches in Egypt and then down into Ethiopia. Yes, question. So. Jesus can't be both Jesus and God and, the and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but God can be both God and Jesus because Jesus is temporal based. <laughs> there wasn't, before he was born, there was no Jesus, I assume. No, there God is, was nope, always there. No, nope, Jesus is eternal. So there is no, there was Jesus before Jesus was born. <laughs> so the, what, so the, yes. the so human part of Jesus is. The human part of Jesus is, like you say, only temporal that's based. temporal, right. oh, okay. but the, but Christ is the second person of the Trinity. It's it's very hard to get, like you say, and so but in, so in the Gospel of John, the formula works like this: in the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the you know which is sometimes translated as the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and what it's saying is that when it's with God, it's with the Creator. So in other words, the Word was with the Father, the Creator. Uh, but the word also is God in the same way that the creator is God. We, gotta, we do have to move beyond fast. So just fast comment, Daniel. <laughs> so. yeah. But it's also quoted in the Bible, Jesus said, I was before Abraham. That's right. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of different ideas that Jesus is a, that exists in, has a pre-existence before he's born in the, in the Christian idea. Okay. So that's enough on Christology. <laughs> so what ends up happening then is uh, uh, in the seventh and eighth centuries, Islam emerges out of the Arabian Peninsula and conquers uh, the whole Persian Empire and then also uh, the portions of the East Roman Empire that are not uh, in union with Constantinople. So these guys, in fact, are being persecuted like crazy by the 
uh, by their Roman or Byzantine leaders uh, for their kind of heresy, their views of Christianity are seemed to, deemed as heretical. The Muslims are very happy. They're like, we don't care what you, what's the difference between what you're saying? You know, you're all not believing the correct way anyway because there's only one God, <laughs> you know? <laughs> there's not three gods. And no matter how you Christians, you polytheistic Christians are saying, you know? So anyway, so anyway, what ends up happening then is there's this Latin West and the Greek East and they're quite cut off then, right? from this Christian Ethiopian kingdom. So uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches, so this is essentially Ethiopian church, the Eritrean church, and then the Coptic church, which exists under Egyptian rule. So maybe 10% of the Egyptian population now has continued to be Christian uh, to this day, I mean. Uh, okay, so the Ethiopian Orthodox church uh, develops on its own traditions, and these are some pretty cool traditions. Uh, for example, they have these, uh, there's maybe a hundred different, this is one of the nicest ones, but anyway, a hundred different monolithic churches which are carved out of like one rock. <laughs> so you can kind of see the rock all around here that's been carved away. This is not like built out of rocks, this is just one rock. <laughs> that's what monolith means, right? <laughs> uh, and so, um, also we talked about this Queen of Sheba question, right? So from the 13th century, so from the Middle Ages onward, the king of Ethiopia, uh, claimed descent from a guy, a traditional guy or um, legendary figure called Menelik I, uh, who is said to have been then the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And so the Queen of Sheba is her, in turn a legendary character in the, from the Book of Kings in the Old Testament. Uh, and she was, comes and visits Solomon. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so the idea is, according to the Ethiopian tradition, is, is that they had a tryst, as Solomon was wont to do, especially towards the end when he had 100 pagan wives and all this kind of thing. Uh, and so then the Queen of Sheba uh, went back to Sheba, which is uh, across the Red Sea from Aksum, uh, and essentially, uh, you know, which is to say Yemen. And the Aksumite kingdom included Yemen at a certain point. And so they actually you know, included both sides of the Red Sea. Anyway, and so whether or not the Aksumites um, or the Ethiopians consider the Queen of Sheba, to, she, whether Sheba is actually Yemen or whether it's Aksum, it doesn't, so either, they own both of them at a certain point. And they more or less say Queen of Sheba comes back and her child is um, the, the ultimate um, legendary heir or founder or whatever of the dynasty that becomes the Ethiopian di royal dynasty. Yes, there's a right behind you, Yvonne. Uh, maybe just to uh, add a little temporal uh, perspective, uh, Aksum controls Yemen around the same time that the prophet Muhammad is born, got a map around here. 570, uh, 570 like AD. Yep, and so it's continuing to be important even after Islam. Um, okay, here's just another picture. This, these churches are so cool, right? Uh, I, want, I want one of those. <laughs> you should go make one. Yeah, can you imagine? Was that like for defensive purposes or something? I think it's just to be cool. <laughs> so, Where are they located, John? Ethiopia. Okay, another thing they got. So this is Aksum, the city of Aksum in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a part of the, the central church, the cathedral of Our Lady Mary of Zion. Uh, then there's a little chapel here. That's the chapel of the tablet. That's a chapel that nobody's allowed to go to, into except for the top Ethiopian uh, clergy because inside there is kept, according to the Ethiopian church, the Ark of the Covenant. So why not? They have that too. <laughs> so they've got that uh, served. So well, that whole movie about you know, Harrison Ford, they, they didn't, that was not, apparently not the real one because <laughs> the real one is here. Okay, and then of course they have their own Bible. Oh, there was a question. Um, is there any historical validity for Queen of Sheba? And I'm thinking, does it relate to, or is there any connections with the Ethiopian Jews? Or were they... Jews right. that migrated from Palestine after, or is there, is there any historical connection with Ethiopian Jews and the uh, Queen of Sheba? It, Elizabeth wants to comment on that. <laughs> Wait, that, that side, that side. My stepmother was a musicologist and she had friends who were musicologists and one of them 
uh, was in that part of the world and went, uh, um, I can't remember exactly, but she, uh, what she wanted to study wasn't available, so she went to um, study the music of the Falasha, the mm. Ethiopian Jews. And she figured that they had, in fact, been Christians who reverted to being Jews, judging by their music and their liturgy. Mm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows. But I, I figure if they say they're Jews and they worship like Jews and they're treated like Jews, they're Jews. Right. But they might have been Christians originally. Yeah, so we'll have to, um, in terms of the, we'll have to get that, take that back. In terms of, we'll, you know, we'll leave with who, the exact, um, all the, you know, the exact status of the Ethiopian Jews to genetic testing. What I can say from history, the historical portion of it, um, so there is already, a, like I said, in the, in the Christian era, so by the 300s and 400s, so be, be, I guess the 200s and 300s, so before it converts to Christianity, there's already a big Jewish presence and influence in the Aksumite kingdom. And uh, after the, even after the Aksumite kingdom becomes Christian, uh, over in Yemen, there is a Jewish uh, ruling dynasty uh, that is actually ruling down there in Yemen, and they actually are at war with the Aksumites eventually, and so one of the, kind of in the heyday of that. So there are very important Jewish communities that are, are down there in Jewish influences, and so there could have been Jews very, very early, there were Jews very early down there. Um, what I would say is that all of that massively um, post-dates when the Queen of Sheba would have been around. So um, I would, I, I personally question whether Solomon is a historical figure, um, uh, much less the Queen of Sheba. So probably I would say that these are later stories, so they're written closer to the destruction of the um, Jerusalem temple. Um, and so for there to be historical basis for it, I would think is unlikely. So there, a lot of times a, a monarchy will almost always have um, an origin story that com comes from somewhere important. So the, um, the, the, the Gus, you know, Julius Caesar is descended ultimately from Aeneas, you know, who is a Trojan prince who escaped from the Trojan War, so he's part of that Homeric epic, right? Uh, likewise, the, because that's such a good story, so that's also true for the kings of the Franks, <laughs> you know, so, so that's also true for Charlemagne. You know, he's also descended from a, a little-known Trojan prince named Francus, actually, it turns out. <laughs> That's what the Merovingians claimed. <laughs> anyway, so so anyway, there's usually those kind of things, and so and so I would say that that's how where the kind of the Ethiopian uh, tradition comes from. But it is a very ancient tradition of connection to Judaism and and Christianity. Okay, so um, one of the things that they have though is their own Bible. So they're cut off. They're not part of these debates that are happening in the Latin West with Augustine and Jerome about what should be in the Bible and what shouldn't. And so it, they have the same Bible. Uh, all the books that were in the Septuagint, so in other words, the same as the Greek Orthodox and also the um, uh, Catholics, but they also then have five additional books, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and three Ethiopian books of Maccabees, which are different from the, the other books of Maccabees um, that exist in the Apocrypha. Okay, so to actually get to the topic of Enoch, <laughs> which we have to do, otherwise you'll all die. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Who, you'll all be as old as Methuselah by the time we get to Enoch, right? So anyway, who was Enoch? Um, uh, Enoch is one of the legendary figures from the, what I call the begets section of Genesis. <laughs> so so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. And so he's included in the lineage from Adam to Noah, uh, which is to say after the Cain and Abel story and before the flood story. And so he's listed as the seventh from Adam and is the great grandfather of Noah. So if we're going to do a, one of the genealogy chart used, you know, from those begets, Adam and Eve, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalil, Jared, uh, Enoch is right here, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and then Noah's three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Ham, Sham, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. That's where Jared is. That's where Jared is. So I will just read, this is what the begets sound like. So this is Genesis 5, 18 and 20. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. <laughs> and so almost all of the begets go like that. So the formula for every one of these guys, we don't know anything more about them almost than that. 
and we'll have a formula. The, the number of years is different for each one of them, but more or less, that's how they all go. Except for this one. <laughs> so, so for Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch, it, before the formula goes, uh, Jared lived after the birth of, it, this one it says, instead of that it says, Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years, so much less. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. And that's it. <laughs> so that's all we got. Uh, but that all by itself you can imagine in a whole list of begats where everybody's living all these thousand years long, and yet we don't have any details of their lives at all until suddenly, boom, you know, here we have a uh, guy who lives only a much shorter time, he walks with God, and then he's no more because God took him. So that uh, has inspired a lot of, let's say, speculation and ultimately fan fiction. So, John, we have only 16 more slides to go through in the next 15 minutes, so I will suggest to everyone maybe we hold our questions yeah, good until the end and we do a Q&A. Yeah, we'll do a we Q&A should... at the end. Thank you. That's a good point. I should have been doing that. Okay, so we're just looking at the Book of Enoch itself now, uh, which we will spend a little time at it. So the Book of Enoch as we have it is divided into five sections or books, and these probably are originally different texts. So probably what's happened is that there's an editor who has put together a bunch of Enoch material, uh, and then in some cases maybe we're putting some of the Enoch material together and maybe expanded it to make another portion of the book. So what we have are called the Book of Watchers, the Book of Similitudes or Parables, the Book of Astronomical Writings, the Book of Dream Vision, and the Book of the Epistle of Enoch. And these are different, you know, kind of in order, the different chapters. Um, and the oldest parts here may be written as early as the fourth or third century BC. And so that's like the Book of Washers and this Book of Astronomical Writings. The Book of Astronomical Writings, um, we had uh, back at the beginning of January, we had a lecture on calendars. And we mentioned how there was this whole Book of Jubilees where they um, completely changed the um, Jewish calendar and created a brand new calendar and they rewrote uh, the Bible, the biblical history in a book called the Book of Jubilees. <laughs> and this different calendar um, which made, meant that they did all their religious services at a different time than all other Jews, um, that was also something that they liked a lot at Qumran. And so they had both Jubilees and Enoch, and they're both on this kind of calendar. And so it's talking about this kind of proposed calendrical reform um, that gets retrojected back. So this was the original calendar, right? This is the calendar that they had back in Enoch's time. And so that makes it, makes it more important. But we can also look at the calendar and say, well, the earliest it could possibly be based on how they created this calendar <laughs> is like the fourth or third century, probably. Okay, uh, and then the more recent stuff then uh, would have been right in the first century, let's say, or the, Ma the later Maccabean period. And so again, there are prophecies about the Maccabean revolt that are very, very specific, just like happens in Daniel. And that's why we can date Daniel so, cl so clearly, because it, it tracks, the book of Daniel tracks everything that happens exactly in the Maccabean history all the way up until one, a particular moment, and then it goes wildly wrong. <laughs> so it gets the next part completely wrong. It makes very specific errors very immediately after, and so we can date Daniel very clearly to when it was written, right, right up to here. <laughs> After that, it wasn't written, and then it was wrong. You know? So essentially, that's how we date Daniel. Likewise, here we can do that with Enoch, which is written parts of it anyway. This book of um, the dream vision is predict making similar kinds of apocalyptic traditions. I'm sorry, apocalyptic predictions, just like are in the book of Daniel. Okay, so we want to look at a couple little portions of the text. Um, and so one of the things that I first was always drawn to when I was a kid <laughs> Um, there's an expansion of this um, flood story, so one of the few stories that exists in Genesis about the time period before Noah. Uh, and so there is an explanation in Genesis that's kind of brief, and again, we don't really understand what it's about, um, and th that kind of begs for an expansion. There's a vast expansion of that in the Book of Enoch that explains what's going on. And so we'll read a little bit of it here. Um, it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them and said one to another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, 
I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of this great sin. So he's got all these guys that are they're like saying, hey, wouldn't that be great to go down and, 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 and get some of these lady humans, you know? And they're like, you're gonna, he's like, you're gonna turn on me. <laughs> and so no, they said, they say, all answered him said, let's swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. So they, they take a blood oath together. And they were all uh, in, I'm sorry, they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And these are the names of their leaders. Sam Lazaz, their leader, uh, Eric, La Eric Labla, <laughs> Eric Obla, Ramiel, uh, Kokablel, Tamlel, Ramel, Danel, Ezequiel, Barakwajal, Asael, Amaros, Batarel, Anal, Zachiel, Samsabel, lots and lots of, anyway, lots of angels. So this is way more angel names than we actually get in the Bible, right? And so now we're to this era now where, and these are actually the fallen angels, right? So these are the bad angels. And so we get a whole bunch of demon names uh, here. Okay, but then after, after they go and do it and they, they go and have the kids and they then um, create uh, kind of a new kind of hybrid society, one of the things they do in the story is then they also do this thing like Prometheus does in Greek mythology, you know, where he gives fire to people. So all these angels now give all kinds of secret knowledge to humanity and so humans can now have uh, uh, cities and have weapons of war and they can have books and things like that because they're taught all of these forbidden knowledge by the bad angels. So then when that all happens, back up in heaven, the good angels are kind of looking down. So then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw how much blood being shed upon the earth and all the lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. And they said to the Lord of the ages, Lord of Lords, God of Gods, King of Kings, and God of the Ages, and that actually goes on, I'll give you a dot, dot, dot there, because otherwise it take on forever. <laughs> Thou seest what Azazel has done, so what one of these bad angels hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven. So he's given away all the secret knowledge. They have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, they have slept with the women and defiled themselves and revealed to them all kinds of sins, and now the women have borne giants and the whole earth is thereby filled with blood and unrighteousness. And so this is the origin, for example, in the, in the Genesis story of you know, the, like, people like Goliath, right? So giants in the earth. So God sends then um, the archangel Uriel to warn Noah and his family of the coming flood, and he sends Michael and the other archangels to go after these fallen angels to bind them, right? And cast them into the pit. And so, anyway, so this is a big expansion of a couple verses in Genesis, and it's actually way longer in Enoch than that. So one of the things that this gives us, though, you know, is this angelology and actually these names of the four archangels. So this is a, um, a Christian church that has Michael, Gabriel, I'm sorry, Michael, uh, what's in the order here? Uriel, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, right? And so there, there they are in, in, the, in the stained glass, um, and so this is, becomes a very important source for angelology, the Book of Enoch. So for these archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, only make, they only make it into the um, Hebrew Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, in the Book of Daniel here. And then Raphael is in the Book of Tobit, which is actually one of the deuterocanonical books, so the Apocrypha. So it isn't actually in the Tanakh, right? Uh, and so Daniel, again, you can see, this is again this, one of this, this late book, uh, the related book, a book where they have these kind of apocryphal, uh, or rather apocalyptic concerns. This is also uh, really on the minds of the Christians, and so uh, Michael and Gabriel have pretty important roles in, in the Christian New Testament. So Gabriel is uh, the, the herald of heaven that comes and has the Annunciation for Mary, you know, Hail Mary, uh, blessed are you among women. Uh, likewise, uh, Michael is in Jude because of this quotation of the, um, of the book of Enoch, but is also in the book of Revelation as the angel with the sword that's casting you know, Lucifer out of heaven, right? And all three of those angels make it into uh, the Quran as well, although Raphael has a different name, uh, but it's understood to be anyway. So they, have, they actually have different names. Close. <laughs> Close names. Um, okay, so this also then becomes uh, the real, like, like I say, it's in the, that, that church we see those four angels, even though Uriel doesn't actually make it into any of the canon. 
So there is not, so also Uriel is sometimes substituted with other names because there are other apocryphal books that say other, uh, that have other names. Uh, but essentially, um, that's what it is in Enoch. And so the most common one. And so for example, as people kind of created this kind of uh, angels of the four corners of the earth, uh, the, of the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, of the cardinal directions, of uh, time and everything like that, then they associate, um, you know, again, the angels with those different points in, in various kinds of mysticism and also magic practices and other things like that. Uh, and just stories about angels. Uh, it's also then a source of this demonology, right? So we have all these names of demons. So behold the names of those fallen angels, and these are their names. The first of them is Samjaza, the second is Artequipa, the third is Armen, the fourth is Kokobel, you know, and so on and so forth. So we have lots and lots of names of devils that also then get mined for um, black magic, right, and sorcery and things like that. Uh, and part of the ideas of even the uh, um, uh, later mythologies of, of, of and elaborations of the stories of hell and things. Um, I'm just I'll quote a little bit of this one. Uh, in the next year of the fallen angels, we have some of the things that these angels taught all of humans, right? Uh, so the secret knowledge. So the third <coughs> of the second tier of fallen angels is Gadriel, he who showed it to the children of men all the blows of death. And he led astray Eve, by the way. <laughs> so now we have the identity of the person who did that. And he showed the weapons of death to some of the sons of men, the shield and the coat of mail and the sword for battle and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And then the fourth is named uh, uh, Penamui. <laughs> and he taught the children of men uh, the bitter and the sweet. He taught them all the secrets of their wisdom and he instructed mankind in writing and with ink and paper and thereby many sinned from eternity and eternity into this day. So people are sinning, they've been told by the demons both the sword and the pen. <laughs> and they've been able to use those for unrighteousness ever since, <laughs> according to the Book of Enoch. Okay, it's also, uh, and one of the reasons why it was so important to early Christians, it's also a big source of uh, uh, messianism. And this was also why they liked it at Qumran. So the Dead Sea Scrolls people are very much uh, people on the outs with the uh, contemporary authorities in Jerusalem. They've been kicked out of, of being able to be the priests in Jerusalem and they looking forward to a day when they and their interpretation and their calendar and every other one of these kind of ideas about purity uh, when a, a, a massive apocalyptic event will occur and they will be the righteous ones that are going to be restored in a new Jerusalem and a new temple, uh, messianic figures that are coming with that. So, for example, here's another portion of Enoch about, uh, about Messiah. So I saw, uh, and there I saw one who had a head of days and his head was white like wool. So there's one big white-headed guy in sky. <laughs> And with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me, so Enoch is going through heaven, is having this vision, he's got a, an angel guide, which is one of the ways you always have these kind of visions. Uh, it's like in the book of Revelation, which is another apocalypse. So I asked the angel who went with me and who showed me all the hidden things concerning that son of man, who he was, and whence he was, and why he went with the head of days. So who is the Son of Man? <laughs> this title, uh, an important apocalyptic title in Second, uh, uh, Second Temple Jewish Apocalypticism. And the answer, I'm sorry, the angel answered and said unto me, this is the Son of Man who hath righteousness, with whom dwelleth righteousness, and who revealed all the treasures of that which is hidden, because the Lord of Spirits has chosen him, and whose lot hath the preeminence before the Lord of Spirits, in uprightness forever. For in those days the elect one shall arise, and he shall choose the righteousness and the holy from among them, for the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved." So you can kind of see here, <laughs> you know, uh, why this, you know, was something that early Christians kind of read and looked forward to, and they saw in terms of their understanding of, of, of Jesus as, as the Messiah, or as the Greek version for that is Christ, um, why they're kind of then seeing, you know, in the, the title um, in the Gospels, Jesus frequently uses then is, uh, calls himself by the title, Son of Man, right? The Son of Man says this and that. Um, anyway, and this idea of, again, an apocalyptic future, uh, and it's about the salvation and the, where the righteous are vindicated. So, um, that's all we have time to dip our oars in, <laughs> but I'll just say then, 
Uh, the, you know, it, there's actually an amazing amount to this book. It's a very um, it's a substantial, it's a long book, and it's had a very long reach. So it has affected, even though it didn't make it into the canon uh, in the Christian West, it actually has um, uh, ended up um, influencing our ideas about angels and demons, and it also influenced, uh, it was also very characteristic of Second Temple Jewish thought, at least among the apocalyptic groups, uh, out of which Christianity emerged. And so when we go back and we look at these things, we can kind of see um, Christianity wasn't such a bizarre thing. How did this thing come out of the root? It's actually, there is this stream that exists. Um, obviously, uh, the rabbinic, proto-rabbinic part is also there too. And the, there's already this division that happens between the two religions even before, uh, even before the canons are formed. So we'll conclude with that with the formal part of the lecture and uh, we'll go ahead into Q&A. Impressive. <laughs> So we had to pause on the, yeah, questions or comments, yes. <laughs> oh, I always forget to Tell us who these different people are in this picture. Oh, in this picture? <laughs> so I, you know, I'm pulling, uh, these are, so I'm pulling illustrations from Ethiopian Bibles, right? And so, because I just want to give people a flavor for them. Unfortunately, I do not speak, um, you know, the Ethiopian liturgical language, you know, and so I can't actually go through and say what the caption says and who these people are. I'm presuming over there there's an angel that's slaying a devil, so there's very likely Michael, and that's very likely Lucifer. Um, is there anything yeah. sticking out at us of what these stories are? <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't identify them all for you. <laughs> that's a devil, yeah. That's why I picked that one. Uh, can you give a, a word on the, uh, there are three books, or three or four books of Enoch, uh, the tradition of, of where it carried in thought between Enoch one, two, three? Four? Yeah, so, um, so this one is the one, I brought this one out because this one is the important one. So, and like you say, this one's called First Enoch. Um, these attributions of the numbers are later than the texts. So essentially, Enoch is a, um, we, I read that in Genesis, right? Where we have that kind of um, nugget of something that just makes people want to know more about that story, right? <laughs> and so this is a figure, you maybe aren't as worried about what happened to Mahalalel, <laughs> you know, because we don't know anything about him, so we don't have any books of Mahalalel. But a lot of people wanted to think about what happened with Enoch as this important figure, and so a lot of people wrote Enoch stories. And so I can even say that in, our, in my own tradition in this, in this church, um, uh, we have from the 19th century a, a piece of scripture that's called the, essentially the vision of Enoch, um, that re, um, where there's a vis, a, an Enoch story you know, that's told again about this, like this, where the story of Enoch is told and about uh, Enoch creating a perfect city where there's a city where everybody, where there's, you know, it's essentially Zion. A, a new Jerusalem that was built in this time, and so that in fact it wasn't only Enoch that walks with God, but an entire society is actually able to be made where uh, they abolish poverty and suffering, where they promote peace, uh, where they live life meaningfully together, and that whole city then is taken up into heaven <laughs> before the flood. Uh, and so anyway, I'm just saying that that's, that would be maybe, if we were gonna assign it a number, then that would be like fifth Enoch. <laughs> and so the other books I would say are either probably they're not related or there may be somebody who has seen this book of Enoch and is writing more, but it didn't, but they aren't, aren't part of the same so tradition. You say years of authorship were about 200 BC. Did I get that right? Somewhere yeah, so different components of the book, of this book of Enoch that we were talking about today, what's sometimes called First Enoch, uh, are composed at different times. The oldest parts are maybe from the fourth and third century, and the latest parts are maybe from the first century BC. So I don't have the dates in front of me. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> John, we either have to use the microphone or you have to repeat the questions. Okay. Yeah, you're, we have to. So go, give the microphone to someone. <laughs> Just a second. I'm going to take a picture of you guys. Thank you. I'm sorry. i got to remember to take pictures. <laughs> Two-part question. Part one. Uh, the Ethiopian liturgical language, is that uh, Coptic Egyptian? No. 
it's its, um, its own I wrote language. it somewhere on here. It's like gay a or gay is. I don't. I I have it written down and I don't know it. Do you know the what it's called, Ivan? Uh, the liturgical language is gay is. Gay is okay. So gay is. And so this is to say ancient Ethiopian. So it would have been the Ethiopian that they would have been speaking back when they translated the text, you know, in the in the four or five hundreds or whenever it would have been. And so then Ethiopian has continued on to the to the present, and there's a you know it's a more modern language. Um, and Coptic is um, is the Egyptian the ancient Egyptian language as it was spoken in um, Hellenistic Egypt. So there's a bunch of Greek loan words, and it's written in the Greek alphabet, or a modified version of the Greek alphabet, but it is the ancient, uh, it's, it's a descendant Hieratic. of ancient Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, and so, in, so essentially that language got displaced uh, by a related, the related language of Arabic when it, in the Islamic conquest, but Coptic then continues to be the liturgical language of the Coptic Orthodox Church, which is in communion with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but they're a different church. They're autocephalous. Okay. Part two, um, the, the two quotations or two or three that you um, provided from the book of Enoch, there was that theme that at least I picked up on about righteousness and that ethical dimension. And I m mentioned one, of the, you saw one of the sli earlier slides that in Quorum that uh, the book of Enoch uh, was part of that canon or part of that tradition. Uh, is, could you comment on the, the the connection or the influence of this on um, some of the the writings from the Dead Sea Scroll. Yeah, so um, I would say that this book is also from the same time period and the same basic uh, uh, genre and era. You know, so uh, people, which is to say, Jewish writers in Aramaic and Hebrew, maybe, uh, who are kind of writing in that. Um, sec later Second Temple period, so after, um, after the Persian Empire has fallen to the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And so in that kind of time period when Greeks are ruling um, uh, Syria and Egypt, and in some cases then when there is a period of independence for the Jewish people under the Maccabees, so, but still the Maccabees almost immediately, um, the Hasmonean kings, even though they're Jewish, they aren't of the right, um, as for a lot of the Jews, they aren't, since they're not Davidic, they're not from the right royal house, and they also are not Zadokite, so they're not from the right priestly line. And so even though they call themselves king and high priest, there's all kinds of um, uh, Jews in the second temple period who feel that these Hasmoneans uh, don't have the right to be king or high priest. And so a lot of them um, are, are kind of on the outs. And so they are sitting around in their own kind of um, like Qumran, they're sitting around essentially in their own kind of exile, self-imposed exile communities, uh, and they are waiting for vindication from God. So um, they have read and they understand, you know, that uh, people who are, are going to be, um, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, if you are wicked, you're eventually going to get cast down and, you know, and fall according to um, the Deuteronomic cycle and the people who are righteous are going to be vindicated. And so they increasingly um, look to kind of apocalyptic predictions of that happening. And so, and so I would say that this text fits very strongly into like a lot of the other apocalyptic texts that they are really excited about at Qumran. So they believe in multiple messiahs. They're not particularly looking forward to a messiah that would be like Jesus, but they believe in actually multiple different spiritual messiahs, a, a priest messiah and a king messiah. Uh, and so, um, and there's a bunch of different predictive texts that are kind of interlaced with their kind of theology. Yes, let's get that back at the very back. Would your guess be that Jesus was familiar with the book of Enoch? <laughs> um, it would be very hard to say. So I don't know how, um, the historical Jesus, it's hard for us to exactly identify um, you know what we would say, <laughs> with the, you know, with, with what he's familiar with, um, to the extent that he's portrayed in the Gospels. So the, the Jesus, as portrayed by the Gospel writers, is very literate in the uh, Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament that they're using is the Septuagint, <laughs> but again, it's a it's a generations later that they're making that portrayal and they're using it. Um, it could be so. Sometimes people 
like to draw a connection between, for example, Jesus is ultimately, uh, his originally connected to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a um, reformer who is living out by the Dead Sea, who is apocalyptic. <laughs> Some people would like to connect him to Qumran, you know, and if you're gonna do that, they've got it. <laughs> so it, it's possible, but, um, you know, there are a couple, yeah, Jane had. Are there followers of Enoch in uh, Ethiopia to this day? Yes, so this is in the canon. So this book is in the Ethiopian Bible. So it is, this, all of this is, and, and so as a result of that, uh, it has influenced different, um, some different traditions apparently in the Ethiopian church. So the Ethiopian church has more, um, they have a lot more ideas about angels <laughs> than anybody else has in their canon, right? Because there's lots of angels and there's lots of demons. There's lots of, um, of talk about the pre-existent Messiah. You know, so there's a lot of apocalyptic predictions of the Messiah that are in the Enoch that we don't have in other, other Christian Bibles. And so as a result, their understanding of it ends up being a little different because it's, in, it's central to their Bible. But you can't call them Christians. They're Christians, yep. It's just Christians with, one, with five more books of the Bible. Um, just in the same way the Catholics have a bunch more books of the Bible than the Protestants. Yes, Daniel. Do you know about uh, why the Enoch named his son Methuselah? Is anything written in that book? Why he named? So um, I would have to know. So my problem in doing these things is that my my ancient language that I have is Latin, and so I don't I don't know Hebrew. So I don't know what Methuselah means in, in I Hebrew. I heard I heard about somebody. The meaning is when you pass away from this earth, it will happen. And uh, okay. some people are calculated, and the, the the age of the Methuselah, when he, the same time he died, the flood happened. Yeah, so so then what you would, we would say then about that is, is that, you know, the, the, the book is composed with that in mind, right? <laughs> so it's either, you can say it either way, it's either the, the God names a, 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 a person or a person has the inspiration. His father is a prophet, right? So Enoch is a prophet. And so he names his son with that knowledge in mind. Or we understand it as a literary prophecy, right? And so it's written after the fact. And, uh, and so that's with that intent literarily. And there's all sorts of puns like that in the Hebrew Bible. So Valerie had one. I'm a complete heathen when it comes to remembering what and where is said in, in the Bible, and especially the New Testament. But did the young Jesus, not, was he not, uh, did he not go missing at one point? His family found him in debate with some or other yes. elders at the temple on yeah. le learned matters. So yes. I would assume that's indicative of his p knowing, you know, scripture, et cetera, right. really well. Right. So you're right. So in the Gospel of Luke, we have, you know, solely in the Gospel of Luke, we have a story of the young Jesus who's, you know, um, one of the signs that, you know, he's going to be who he is, is that as a boy, he's in the, he found in the temple and he's um, astounding all of the, all of the scholars. And, and so there's, when we're talking about, when there's a question when I'm asked about the historical Jesus, that's very different from the Jesus of the Gospels. So there's no particular reason to assert, assert that that's a historical story. It's a story of how Luke understands Jesus um, based on Luke's theological text and writing. And so the way Jesus is portrayed in the Gospel of Luke, yes, Jesus would have known everything, right? And so, <laughs> and so, and so would have therefore known Enoch, you know. One person who obviously was conversant with, if not the book of Enoch, an awful lot of the stuff here was John Milton. Oh, yeah. Uriel, I think, shows up. I think Uriel is in Paradise Lost. Yeah, I don't know. Awful lot of the stuff is in Paradise Lost. Yeah, I don't know. Lost. So I'm not sure that if it's been re Certainly found by the, hand um, that by the time Milton has it. But these, some of these ideas still keep oh, yeah. on, you know, in other words, they retain some of these things. Yeah. Uriel is certainly one of the soloists in uh, Haydn's creation, okay. which is book seven of Paradise Lost. Yes. So whether he, whether he directly has it, he has intermediate texts then that give him those names. But anyway, those, those names of those angels have been maintained in the traditions, whether or not, like I say, same thing with um, whether or not the, the, that proto-gospel of Mary 
um, stayed in the canon, the stories stayed there, right? And so you have a question here. Interested in the, um, the Ethiopian church. Uh, it yes. seems almost like a, a lost tribe, to, to use a bad metaphor, but uh, could you provide some information in terms, do they have a, is a pope? Is there a lineage that they claim that has been dissented uh, uninterrupted? Is there like a priest king, like a Melchizedek, or provide some more informa historical yeah. information on the Ethiopian church, please? Yep, so it goes back to, I mean, their founder is Fermentius, and so he will have been the first um, bishop of Axum, and so uh, the church will be led at this point by a patriarch, and so that the first patriarch will have been Fermentius. And it will have been a succession, uh, um, you know, apostolic succession going back to, you know, when you, technically when you're the first guy that converts the place, so you're often called the apostle to the, to the Ethiopians. And so Fermentius would be that in the same way that um, St. Patrick, right, is the apostle to the Irish, even though he's actually, the Irish patron saint is actually British, right? And that's not fun for the Irish <laughs> if they think about it. <laughs> anyway, as a British guy who went over to Ireland and converted everybody. Same thing, I mentioned that the, um, the apostle to the French is pseudo pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. But anyway, Saint Denis. <laughs> anyway, and so in the same way, it would be that way. And then there'd be an apostolic succession in Axum, you know, the bishops of Axum, the patriarchs, all the way down to the present. Um, they, uh, it's therefore a, a patriarch. The patriarch, uh, the, these Eastern churches are all autocephalous, which means that um, they're, they're, they don't recognize any other thing as being ahead of them. However, um, they are in communion with the Eritrean. Orthodox Church, which is more recent because Eritrea is not part of Ethiopia anymore, and also with the Coptic Orthodox Church. So the um, patriarch of Alexandria uh, in Egypt, who is a successor of St. Mark according to Egyptian tradition, and so, um, you know, St. Mark the Evangelist is the apostle to the Egyptians. And so anyway, so St. Mark, um, uh, uh, so anyway, that guy, who's the current uh, head of the Coptic Church, also has the title Pope. And so there's very, um, is the only, I think he's the only one who I know of anyway, other than the, the Pope of Rome that retains the title, so the Pope of Alexandria or, or Patriarch. And so he would be the first among equals in the, within the communion, the, the Alexandrian um, Patriarch, but the, the one in Axum is, is in communion with him, but also autocephalous. So follow up. Follow-up question, and this may be a little um, off-center. So, um, the is there a connection with this Book of Enoch, the Ethiopian Church, and Rastafarianism? And yeah, the, so the question, yeah. Haile Selassie, right. the, the last king of kings, the last emperor. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else we can throw in, but yeah. th those, yeah. that connection. Okay, so we'll, we'll do this as the, the last question and a formal question. <laughs> I, do have, I do have one more question. Okay, there's one more question, so this is not the last. This is the penultimate question. <laughs> and, then, uh, and so Rasta, how does Rasta fit into this? Mm -hmm. And um, we're not supposed to say Rastafarianism because Rasta is against isms. <laughs> and so yeah. they're not an ism and they're anti-ism. Uh, Rasta emerges in uh, uh, the West. It's a kind of a post-Christian um, uh, black empowerment religion uh, that is both in the United States and in anyway the West, but also in Jamaica especially, uh, and um, saw uh, the last, Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia as being kind of a predicted second messiah. Uh, and so um, they created, it's created a, a very serious um, religion that is in some ways a little bit, that pulls from stuff from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but is its own religion on top of it. And so it's not, um, Haile Selassie, uh, al although was aware of it, um, did not um, claim to be this Messiah and was, did not, not participate in the religion. So it's a religion that has a kind of Messiah figure who was alive and who's now passed away or maybe gone into occlusion, you know, so he's not um, anyway with us in, in the flesh. Uh, but. Um, it's developed on its own, in its own tradition. There is a Rasta center here that we go to in Encounter World Religions, and the practitioners are actually um, very, very serious in their interpretation of the text, and that includes things like Enoch. So they are interested in, in these books. 
um, but they read them in their own particular way, that is a Rasta way, that is not the same and not part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And Andrew had one. Uh, yeah, no, it's not me, but Leon Berg oh, yeah. uh, from Facebook is asking, Hi, John, if you have any thoughts about Joseph Smith Jr. enhancing the Enoch story in the Old Testament. Right. So I mentioned this before I said that uh, we have um, in our church or tradition uh, of a uh, 19th century book of scripture, uh, which is an expansion, essentially a vision of Enoch. Uh, and so it's part of what um, our church has traditionally called uh, inspired version of the Bible. Uh, we now call it scholarly, we call it the Joseph Smith Bible revision because it's his own kind of personal revision of things. It includes um, a long um, additional visions uh, that he is writing and composing uh, uh, based on his own theology and philosophy and those kind of things, uh, or inspiration. Um, so in the same exact way that I would don't consider Enoch to be a historical character, and so all of the scriptures, as far as I'm concerned, are written um, by, about Enoch, are written by people who are um, trying to explore their own theological ideas and their own, um, let's say, in the case of the apocalypse here, of e the book of Enoch here, their own predictions for um, that, that eventually there will be an apocalypse and then also a society where, uh, where justice will prevail you know, where all of this wickedness that we perceive in the world will finally end, you know, and there will be, uh, you know, the lion will lie down with the lamb like over here on our peace seal. Uh, so in that exact same way, what Joseph Smith is doing is also that same kind of um, midrash composition of, of um, holy stories or new sacred stories based on uh, biblical figures. And last one. <laughs> talking about canon. Yes. And I wasn't aware there was a Jewish canon. Yes. So could you explain what canon is? So what is a canon? So canon is simply uh, like it means essentially church law is what the, the word is going to mean. And so it, it so it's the law for what books make it in the list. So it's essentially your official registry of the book. So we now think of, we, it's very easy for us to just have a Bible as one book, and we, ha, we, we live in this age of wealth or one ebook or whatever it is, and so it's all very easy. In antiquity, you never would have, nobody had that. There's only one or two full Bibles, you know, that are coming to us from antiquity, and they're very rich, and they're in the Vatican, you know, treasury and things like that. Nobody had that. They had, um, the reason why these things are all called books is, they're all, and they're all about the same length, is that that's the length of a scroll. And if the book is too long, like Kings, It'll, they'll break it up into first and second kings and it's two scrolls and that's why you know it's there's two books or Ezra and Nehemiah are one book but they're broken up into two scrolls or whatever uh, and so essentially all you have is that scroll <laughs> you don't have the whole thing and so what you end up having is you may you're never rich enough to have the whole Bible probably so you may well have five or ten scrolls and so you're not sure what um, what counts as Bible and what counts as not Bible so that's why you have a list and that list is the canon of what's, what's legally, officially, the stamp of the church of, what's, uh, of what it is. And Judaism has that too. So the rabbis all decided this is the list and this is what counts and this is the order. So the rabbis first did it before? The first time we have it, no. It's hard to say. Now, the, both the development of the canon is happening kind of simultaneously um, as we saw. But I guess, yeah, the rabbis are done with their canon before the Christians are done with their canon. Uh, but then that, the rabbi's work goes on. So they eventually come up with a much more, let's say, uh, secure system of getting it right <laughs> so that each copy um, is going to be the same as each other one. So the rabbis are much more um, diligent about that than the people in the West are who, like I say, mostly just read it in translation, right? <laughs> so Christians are a little bit more, you know, lackadaisical because for Christians, <laughs> The difference is, you know, then Christian, Christianity between Judaism and Islam is, for Christians, the, what, the word of God is not the Bible. The word of God is Christ. Christ it says, like I said at the beginning with, the, with John, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So for Christians, um, you know, Christ and the spirit are just as important or not as, what the, as the text. The text is meant to point us to God. With that, we'll end and we can talk discussion over snacks. Thank you guys. <laughs>
Thank you.